Hi, I'm Kevin Churko, and you're in my studio at The Hideout, Las Vegas. Some of the artists I've produced recently are Ozzy Osbourne, Five Finger Death Punch, In This Moment, Papa Roach. I've won four Juno Awards, which is a Canadian Grammy, uh, basically all for Engineer of the Year, and one of them was shared with my son, Kane, who co-engineered on the Five Finger albums and the In This Moment albums, too. And I guess my true production career started with the Ozzy record, which is kind of a funny thing to start with. I mean, I, I've been produ you know, producing music my whole life, at different levels and I've been working for great producers people like Mutt Lang and some other people in LA but basically I was there to serve them and you know to do the best job for them so my most notable first gig was the Aussie gig and that started out as an engineering gig as well and it was really a matter of that uh, Aussie had just built a studio uh, a friend of mine David Frangioni had built his studio and had a, he had kind of limited resources for space the drum room was very small and Ozzy couldn't understand how the drums were going to sound big. And he always liked that Phil Collins kind of sound, so he said, can you get that? And so David said, hang on, let me call a friend. He can come by. He used to work for Mutt Lang. He can come by. He's a drummer. He can set up a drum kit. He can record it for you and show you how it sounds. So David called me, and luckily I had the night off. And I drove over there, set up his little kit, and mic'd it up and played some stuff. David called Ozzy in. and. You know, we had a good time playing back the drums, and I think more importantly, I met some of Ozzy's people, and they remem remembered me af after that. And then so when Ozzy was doing demos with Zach Wilde for the Black Rain album, and they realized they could make a record there, that times had changed. You didn't have to go into a $1,500 a day room. He could just make it sitting at home, which is really what he wanted to, to, to do. So they did some demos and said, this is great. And then, but they wanted somebody that they could, they could definitely um, you know, count on for the sounds. They remembered me, they called me, and came in for a week, sort of a trial thing, and everything went well, and we took it from there, and engineering led to sort of the other steps of the process, too, until finally in the end, you know, I actually did the mixes, too, which is quite a feat, you know, considering I had real no big mixing credits to my name at that time. You know, I'd always mixed my own stuff, but I had just never had that opportunity, and so Ozzy gave me that. One of my best stories is the first time he started to sing, and we had gone over the song and he knew the track and I was standing up facing him and he was on the mic and I was facing him standing up you know with him so I could be eye level and he started singing and just as singers do and as everybody does all of a sudden you know as he's spitting out the rock and roll words he's literally spitting out the rock and roll words and my face is all of a sudden being on slide <laughs> with, with spit and all I could think of okay so what do I do now do I do I stop him or move away or shelter myself with a towel or do I never wash my face ever again and say this is the spit of Ozzy Osbourne on my face and uh, you know so I, I just basically went through the take and then I positioned us a little bit different but I mean that that was pretty pretty funny to you know to be blessed you know with that spit so you know I'm good with it <laughs> You know, there's really no secret, I have to say. There's probably less of a secret than what people think. If you have a great guitar player who already has defined a sound, somebody like Zach Wilde, all I'm there to do is recreate that, is try to capture that as honestly as I can. And honestly, that those records were recorded with a 57, and there was a condenser too, I can't remember which one, a sure condenser, you know, I can't remember off the top of my head which one it was but two mics, most of them favoring the 57 through a knee preamp, very simple, not complicated, no compression. I wasn't even, I don't even think I was tweaking the EQ. It was just capture his sound as honestly and uncolored as I could. And you might have to move the mic around a little bit and those kind of things until it sounds right. But he's already defined a sound, so I'm not creating anything, I'm just trying to capture it. He's already sounds like Zach and I'm not trying to make it any different than that. You know, so those are in a sense the easy gigs, I think, and some guys make it complicated and I've definitely had sessions where I've had like eight mics on an amp and two on the back of the cab and then 
four out in the room and just for fun let's do all these things and see which ones we use and most of the time that $100.57 is the one that wins and maybe even a 421 for a little bit more brittle bite depending on what kind of music it is but you know I really don't think it's that complicated as long as the guitar player is good and the app is set up properly but really there's you know I, I hate to say it but there's no one three steps to get the good guitar sound it's just be conscious of what's going on and one thing I do do is I, I compare a lot of times to other records I've liked to make sure I'm on the right path because honestly you, you can listen to any sound for eight hours and at the end of eight hours you think that that's the best sound you've ever heard particularly if you're cranking the volume so maybe a tip would be not to crank the volume sometimes at least listen to it at a lower volume to see if it still speaks the same way quietly as it does when it's on 11. I worked with a lot of great guitar players who have to have an 11 to feel the power uh, and that's good when they're playing, they need to feel that vibe, they need to, you know, be in the zone. But after that's over with, I like to turn it down and say, well, how's this going to sound quiet? Is it still going to be as energetic and does it still have the same bite at a lower, lower volume? So that's, some, that's one thing I always do. Honestly, I try to get almost one of everything at the start. I like to try it all out. I mean, you never know when you're going to run into that new plugin. That's the best thing you've ever had. However, an EQ, most of them, an EQ is an EQ is an EQ. There's certain ones that sent out for me in my process as far as how they work. But honestly, on any given session, I am a man of few plugins. You know, at this stage, it's always, I have to work fast a lot of times, and I don't really have the luxury of taking a year to make a record the way that they've done some in the past, you know, some of the great ones I've loved. So you have to have tools that can get you there fast. And so, you know, th that's what I even, uh, uh, lean towards your plugins is it just just doesn't have to sound good it has to get me to the end of my day faster or let me do more work in my my day so I don't want something too complicated you know the suppressor is actually a really great plugin because it has an easy mode but if you need to dial it in more you can go into the more complicated mode and set different attack and release times and those things are really valuable to me because it almost becomes a one-touch plugin at first but if you need to go deeper you can so that's why I gravitate towards those plugins. Anything that can get me there with one move is fantastic, but how often does that happen when you only need one move? I mean, usually, you know, there's automation that has to happen, and you know, you've got to be able to control a little bit deeper, and those are the plugins that I like. Uh, so in the end, I gravitate towards a few plugins, and to be honest, it's hard to get me to change, you know, in the sense that once I like it, I just use it. I mean, to be honest, I've been using the Sonics EQ ever since it was first out. Uh, and it's never changed because for me it's probably one of the best subtractive EQs that I can I can go go to where I'm not worried about the sound of the EQ I'm just worried about the sound of the instrument or the sound of the vocal and I think that's it that's a huge benefit for for me is I'm not listening to the EQ so when I don't want to hear the EQ I go to the sonics you know that doesn't mean that happens every time because sometimes you want to hear the distortion that, that, that the EQ brings in but that's generally, you know, that's one of my first go-to pieces of gear. I think Sonics for me, quite honestly, is just a brand I don't have to worry about. That's why I like it, because it's dependable in the sense that every plugin is good. It's just very solid and dependable, it only does what it says and doesn't do weird things that I'm not noticing straight away. I listen back later, I use the same, you know, vocal channel I have for years and years and, and uh, you know, it's a go-to EQ, it's a go-to, uh, you know, compressor. I mean, they're just really solid piece, pieces of, of gear. I call them pieces of gear, but they're plugins. Uh, that I can always de de depend on. It can get me to where I need to go fairly, fairly quickly. All right, so let me take you through a couple of uses on my master bus of the Sonics plugins. Pretty much every mix I've done for probably the last, I don't know how many years, probably 10 years, I've had the Sonics EQ as the first plugin in the chain. And what I normally do is I normally just roll off a little bit of bottom, a little bit of top, but it also acts sort of like a mastering EQ too in the sense that if I end up at the end of my mix, I don't want to change a whole bunch of things, but it's maybe a little bit high midi or something, I can, you know, just bring it down enough, just like a master would, not too crazy, not too hard, just a little bit of a soft dip. Or if I find I need a little bit of top or something like that later, just like, you know, someone would do in the mastering, you know, I would just do that. Of course, on this, I don't need that right now, so I'm going to turn that off. But that's almost always my entry point, and that gets rid, of, of course, of un unwanted and unnecessary bottom, bottom end. 
as well as some top that I don't necessarily you know need need to be here and just kind of pro protects against some ticks and pops and whatever that may happen that I'm not even listening to so that's almost always on it on every master chain so basically what you're looking at this is my master my master chain and then usually after that I'll have a compressor or something but the inflator comes quickly after I always use the inflator on every mix as well but I use it in varying varying amounts uh, you know and as well as having it on my my chain I can also actually go into automation and a lot of times I'll automate the input gain here you know because sometimes I don't need as much limiting or as much saturation as you know the chorus I might need a lot the verse I might not need much so I can actually automate that all the way through in this case I've only automated it in this point here um, not finished this mix yet so it probably won't end up like that in the end it'll probably end up somewhere more like something like around there I'd say is probably where it's gonna end up but you know I'll fool around with the with the fact here a little bit and that's you know kind of the, I guess you know I guess kind of the saturation of the of the inflator that that's how it inflates the sound is you know you can to me I always call it like a saturator even though I, I'm sure technically that's not the right term but louder without physically being louder I guess is a term which usually means saturation or less you know I'll fool around with the curve here this is gonna be sort of um, this will be a little tighter sounding with more transients this will be a little bit sort of softer you know wider sounding uh, so I'll fool around with that but you know typically this is probably quite close to how it would be in most of my tracks and I'll, you know occasionally I'll go back and this is the clip meter that you can it's sort of like an automatic clip clip eliminator so so if you're out of section like here you know you can take that off and that's you know how much over, over digital zero I guess I'm going and that's what it's starting to compress before it gets into the effect tone I guess uh, so that's generally what my you know channel channel uh, my master channel bus is doing let me take you to, through a couple of my uses of the suppressor, which, uh, you know, I use from everything. I can use from, you know, the DSing version of it to even something like, like a keyboard. You know, here's, here's a keyboard patch that I use on this particular song. It was this note in particular that was... You can hear that. I really liked the piano part of it. I really liked all that ambience. But every now and then it takes off like that note. You can hear how much louder that little ambient part is then. A little bit there, not too much, and then all of a sudden, woo, right there. So that's that's what I wanted to take out. Now, usually I'd just automate an EQ and just take that frequency out at that point, but then I gotta go through the whole song, and every time that note hits or that sort of sound starts becoming more evident, I have to you know automate an EQ on that. But if, if I put the suppressor on that, so still get the whole sound but here you can tell that that's a lot different than this you know, without, that's with that ooh sound is too loud you put the suppressor on and it's less and the, this this is how I go about doing that I'd put it on the inside settings so I, that you're just listening between these two points and I'd even maybe loop loop that so we're just listening between there and just to give you an example how that sounds let me, let me put it on loop you know this is just between those two I just keep scrolling down till I found the exact frequency I didn't like where it takes off the most okay that's what I don't want right then turn it back into mix mix mode and so you can see it's compressing that area the hardest it's not compressing here or here it's just kind of attacking that and that way, and once if then I'll just kind of you know fool around here a little bit until it hits as hard as I want it to. But that's a lot easier for me personally than going through and automating the EQ. Uh, another way that I use a suppressor is actually on bass. Now this is going to be a really distorted bass as part of the chorus uh, when the chorus starts hitting. It allows me to bring all these top frequencies up on a bass on a distorted bass and yet uh, limit it from sounding too nasally. So. Right. Turn the suppressor on. Uh, 
again, it's just hitting the area that I want it to hit, hit the heart, it's just right, right here. But if I don't have that, just end up sounding like that. If I take the EQ off, it sounds completely dull now, at least for my purposes. Brighten it up, I need to kind of be gentle with it and you know, take it not too fine of a point. And then I can, with the suppressor, I can kind of bring back some of those irritating frequencies, those high mid frequencies that'll get in the way of my mix of the guitar frequencies or the vocal frequencies. But it still has a little bit more grind and great than it would have without that. You turn a little bit of those vocals off. Turn it off. Here it pokes out in a weird way. Turn that on, I get all the joy of the extra top top end, but without having it poke through too much and the irritation of, of that kind of, kind of that high mid kind of three three K ish tone. Alright, so a lot of times, especially with a female singer, and Maria from In This Moment is definitely one of my favorite singer, favorite female singer of all time. But Anybody, myself included, or male or female, that you know, they're going to sing differently soft than loud, and a lot of times you get a, a, a little bit more sort of low mid when they're close to the mic and singing soft. And on this particular song, it's all about emotion and all about vibe, so you know you can tell she's singing soft here. Let me turn these other ones off. Now that's pretty quiet, so what happened was I was having a little bit of a problem with, you know, again, that low frequency, in this case about 251, so you can see how, how I automate it, pull it down according to when that frequency starts taking off. Now again, if I turn this off, you know, this is the frequency I'll boost it to. So that's the frequency that I'm dipping, alright, so I find the frequency. And then I'll literally just, you know, if you have an automated master fader, you can use that or something. In my case, I just literally zoom in and start drawing it out. You know, old school, like, you know, I'll just keep dipping it until it sounds right. I'll just use that sound a lot better than... You know, they're all very subtle things, but all these subtle things on the mix really start to add up after a while. And you have that weird frequency on the vocal and that weird frequency on the keyboard I just played for you and you know after a while you just get build up and it's surprisingly how unclean your mix will sound or how small it starts sounding you know by not taking these frequencies out um, you know again on a vocal I'm always you know shaving off bottom and top and you know doing that whole thing but you know this part unlike say on a chorus part where I'm gonna hit the chorus you know she's belting that so you know, that's actually a different frequency than I was, you know, so then you go to the mid frequency that as a female singer, whenever she starts or anybody starts really yelling it out, in this case, it's just slightly saturated as well. But you'll hear how, you know, now I'm taking out one K. But you can't, if you boost that, you, you can hear how it'll just start taking off after a while. So I just found that frequency much like we just did the low frequency and start doing that start you know taking it out in the places that I, that I that I need it out in some cases it's it's a di dynamic thing I mean it starts off you know starts a little deeper at the end I'm just exaggerating this because as she gets quieter again it takes shape a different way if you go back in fact let me put both those frequencies on so that's the mid frequency and let's do the um, let's do the low low mid frequency again all right so now you can see throughout the vocal these are this is obviously the verse where she's singing quiet you know again she's singing as soft as this you know those kind of things whereas uh you know here she's really starting to belt it out and that's when the high mid frequency started taking off there now, of course, you could do what most people do is just put these on different tracks and just EQ it dif differently. But obviously, even within that line, 
I'm bringing it up, I'm letting it go back up or go up to, to zero again, bringing it back down for certain words. And that's, that's always really the only way to make that voice even, you know, you know, all the way across. It's just, it's n not a trick. You just keep doing it until it sounds right. And even, you know, and you're never really done. You always think you can do it better or do it over and over again, but eventually it sounds, let's just say, good enough. You can see the automation on the EQ. This is how hard I'm hitting it here. It's not crazy, but it does help just helps to keep it flat and that's all before my compressor which is actually I put on a, a auxiliary at a different place but you know I like to straighten the EQ out before the compressor I know some guys like to EQ after the compressor but I'd rather have the compressor do as little as it can and by eliminate some of these low low mid peaks or high end peaks it kind of the compressor has to work less hard and therefore it'll just sound more natural uh, but again, I do compress quite a bit, especially on the low stuff. You can you can s tell how you know she starts singing quieter. I want to hear every every syllable when she sings. You know, if you can improve it, why not? You know, you might as well try to make it as good as you possibly can. And these are the tools you know that let me do that. And a lot of times, my automated EQ is just a flat Sonics. I mean, I really find that the Sonics is as a subtractive EQ is really second to none in the sense that it doesn't really color the audio as much as it does just take out the frequencies you don't want. I mean, I will still boost, you know, frequencies with the Sonics too, but I really find for me that I really, it's most effective by taking frequencies I don't want out without shaping it, without causing weird things to go on. You know, I'm just looking to fix up some low end and some high mid, and that's basically my, you know, my little vocal EQ trick. So that would be some of the Kevin Churko uses of the suppressor, inflator, and EQ made by Sonics, employed and used by many. And there you go. And a little bit of In This Moment's newest, newest track. So, Hope you enjoyed it. If you like some of the song, don't be afraid to buy it. That's how we live. Alright, thanks.